Welcome back to another JoJo chapter review. This time we're taking a look at chapter 16 of the JoJo lands titled That Girl's Bag's Groove. In the last chapter, Usagi came under attack by a stand ability which was triggered by the investigating of the deeds of Howler's land. We were also introduced to Charming Man's stand, Big Mouth Returns, which located the stand but caused Charming Man to come under attack as well. Finally, we heard that the clerk at the land registry office who was also attacked is the daughter of a congressman investigating Howler's illegal activities. This chapter starts with some narration explaining the current situation. They say that the stand is an automatic pursuit type which was planted on the deeds like landmines, and they wonder why the enemy wanted to attack them for browsing it and that from their perspective they must be wondering who they are and are trying to find it out. We come back to inside the van where Charming Man has developed a tumor in his eye after touching the stand. With everyone's condition worsening, Jodio tells Dragona that since the stand is automatic, it isn't getting direct orders and therefore has to follow a set of rules. He says that the stand moves through the body to attack it in a predetermined pattern and tells them to send smooth operators to catch it. Jodio uses November Rain to send a drop down Dragona's windpipe which destroys the immobilized stand. With Dragona saved, they now turn their attention to Usagi, who has the worst of the symptoms. Jodio says they have to defeat the enemy before they can figure out who they are. He says that he has a plan to head to a hospital and use an MRI machine to locate the stand in Usagi's body to eliminate it. They use Usagi's stand to once again alter the security cameras at the hospital so they won't show up on it. Back at the land registry office, we're introduced to a man reviewing the disguised footage of Dragona, Usagi, and Charming Man entering the building. We learn that the man's name is Bobby Jean, and he seems to be some kind of investigator. This is the first of our two music references for the chapter, with his name being based on a song by Bruce Springsteen. This is actually the first time Springsteen has been referenced in JoJo, although we've known before that Araki is a fan of him. A security guard tells him that the three people who visited were students and just looked at the land deeds without taking any photos. The guard wonders what Bobby Jean is investigating and if it's related to Howler's suspicious activities. Bobby says that he's off duty today and just decided to look into it because three people browsing the original copies of deeds seem strange. Next we meet a young girl who Bobby claims to be babysitting. She's interested in a hula dancing cat figure in the security room that she thinks is cute. She asks Bobby to buy one for her, and after hearing it isn't sold anymore, she gets him to try and bribe the guard for it. The guard tries to turn down the money and even tries to give up the figure for free, but Bobby insists that he takes the money. The girl has a nosebleed and then notices that there's no footage of the three people leaving the building. She points out that behind the ambulance that picked up the clerk, a van is seen picking up three others. Bobby says they're unrelated since they weren't on the earlier footage, but the guard recognizes Usagi for the scene he caused by spilling his food in the lobby. The girl sees that Usagi is sick in the footage, leading to the conclusion that the footage was doctored to change their appearances as well as their vehicle. The girl says that she doesn't care either way about them or what they do, since someday all people will die without exception. She says that her nosebleed is a sign that one of her stand, Bag's Groove, was beaten. So it's revealed here that the girl is the user of the stand attacking the group. The name of the stand is referencing a jazz composition by Milt Jackson, which was famously covered by Miles Davis, with it also being the title of a Miles Davis album. We know Araki is a fan of Miles Davis and has referenced him a few times, so this is likely where he got it from. The girl says that they should check the traffic cameras and concludes that the people investigating the deed are stand users. We go back to the group as they arrive at the hospital, accidentally arriving on the wrong floor. Jodio says that he's really bad with three-letter acronyms since he accidentally pushed the button for the ICU instead of the MRI. This seems to be calling back to Jodio's conversation with Charming Man, where he said he mixes up his favorite singers with three-letter names. They notice the clerk from the land registry who is in critical condition. Charming Man says that despite her not doing anything, she was attacked first. Paco calls the situation absurd, which again touches on Jodio and Dragona's past involving absurd events. We see the girl's father, a congressman named White, crying while thinking of signing a document on his tablet. We learn that he is planning to use state authority to seize Howler's land to discover their activities. He believes that the attack on his daughter is retaliation for this. She flatlines and he leaves the unfinished signature on the tablet behind. The group realizes the mechanism of the Lava Rock actually created this situation, allowing them to transfer the land. Dragona uses smooth operators to move the congressman's fingerprint and complete the process. 
This was a really amazing chapter. Not only was this one thrilling from a stand battle action standpoint, but it also brought a ton of new points into the story. First of all, I want to focus on our two new antagonists, Bobby Jean and the user of Bag's Groove. So far, I really like these two. Starting with Bobby Jean, I really like his design and he feels unique for JoJo. He reminds me a lot of the kind of designs we got in Steel Ball Run which we haven't gotten for a long time. And the little girl is a very funny character and she seems to switch between a cutesy personality and a more serious one with a nihilistic outlook. While it isn't directly stated, it's clear that these two are working for Howler and are looking into what happened to the deed. What's interesting though is that these characters don't seem to have an emotional stake in what's going on. Bobby Jean seems to just be doing his job and the girl sort of acts like a passive observer not caring about the outcome. I feel like this gives us an idea of what we can expect from a villain group like Howler. In the JoJo series, we've gotten many villains that are motivated by intense philosophical ideas, but for something like Howler, I have to wonder what exactly those ideals might be. I suspect we're going to get something different with them that's more like a critique of a modern corporation. While Howler as a whole seems to be behind a series of illegal activities, the individual members, good or bad, are like cogs in a machine that contribute towards that with varying levels of enthusiasm. Araki has said Jojo is a celebration of humanity, including all the good and bad that comes from it. So I think it's interesting that our villains here may not have the traditional motivations of Jojo's antagonists. Instead of being motivated by an evil but still human belief, they're emotionless agents in a system controlled strictly by capital. The other main thing I want to focus on is the ending scene and the mechanics of the Lava Rock. Here the gang gets put into a situation where they can allow Howler's land to be seized by the government. Of course, this is still just a first step, and the land will then have to go from the government to Merrill May somehow to complete the mission. But I think the way that this actually happened is very interesting. First of all, the only reason this could happen in the first place is because the clerk, Sophie White, died. If it weren't for that, then the congressman wouldn't have run off to let them move the fingerprint. But if you really think about it, that's a huge thing for the Lava Rock to cause. Earlier we thought that Sophie was targeted by Bag's Groove to intimidate her father who was looking into Howler, and that's actually what the congressman believes in this chapter, but I'm not quite sure that's the case. For one, the user of Bag's Groove only casually mentions that the clerk fell ill. If that was their intended target from the beginning, then I feel like it would have been acknowledged by them in some way. And targeting Sophie doesn't seem to actually help Howler, since in his distressed state, the congressman is actually close to signing the land seizure, despite his assistant telling him there isn't enough evidence to do so yet. So I actually don't think the clerk was the main target, and was more like collateral damage in targeting whoever's investigating the deeds. We are told that the mechanism of the Lava Rock operates through people's emotions and connections. In the luxury watch store, Dragona unconsciously used their stand to steal the watch, which caused the series of events for them to get it later. So I think the same was true in this case. I believe the Lava Rock caused Bag's Groove to target the clerk in particular since her death was necessary to transfer the land. The same is true for some other actions, like how the group were put in this situation in the first place. Jodeo accidentally went to the wrong floor of the hospital for them to see this, so Jodeo also performed an unconscious action as part of the mechanism. This actually makes the mechanism of the Lava Rock pretty scary, since it kind of implies that it caused the death of this innocent girl as just a step in a larger process which nobody had actual control over. Notably, Paco refers to the situation with the girl as absurd, hearkening back to Jodeo's backstory and Dragona's bullying in Chapter 13. There, the vicious bullying Dragona endured caused Jodeo to lash out against her attackers, but this caused a chain of events that led to their father losing his job and leaving the family, and causing Jodeo and Dragona to enter a life of crime to protect their mother. This situation is referred to as being absurd because it was something nobody could have predicted or had control over. The fact that the same language is being used to refer to this situation which comes as a result of the rock's influence is interesting to me, since it indicates that these absurd situations are more controlled than they appear. In Part 6, Pucci had a very similar dilemma with the death of his sister Perla. He wondered who could have been at fault for her death. If it could have been him, Weather, the detective, or Weather's adoptive mother who originally started the chain of events. This is what drew Pucci to Dio to try and answer the question of why people meet. This theme is continuing in Part 9, not just with the mechanism of the Lava Rock, but also all the other mechanisms that combine to make up the world and the faded path that it follows. That's about all I have to say for this month's chapter. I actually ended up getting a lot out of this one, and I think this is where all the pieces really click together to start understanding the main themes behind this part. 
I'm very excited to see where this is going to evolve next month, where we'll likely get the continuation of the stand battle. If you want to stay updated on new videos, make sure to subscribe and click the bell. You can also hear about new uploads and chapter releases by joining the Hum and Beat Discord using the link in the description. Finally, I'd appreciate it if you help support the channel on Patreon. There you can receive Discord perks and submit patron questions. I answer patron questions at the end of my main videos, so if you join at any tier, feel free to submit as many as you want. Thank you for watching. This is the part of the video where I thank my $5 and up patrons. Thank you to Sloth Dog, Doorbell, Crayon, Rigo Vids, Zucato, Pumpkin Doge, Marrow, Almighty Korth, Gatling Grove, Lime Jinjo, Sponge Cake, Kakext, Feliciano Rabaja, Rayana Meme, Christian McDonough, Emmanuel Etienne, Pulse Dog, Great Riek, Carmotrina, Zach Greenfield, FIFO, Rob Goliath, Jacob Smith, Big T, C Manga, Minty, Gold, Red Hot Mayonnaise, Jolene, Monticelli, Zenkai, Royal Slush, Lyra, and Chongo.